hold this to where is it? Good morning, please be seated. As long as poverty, injustice, and gross inequality persist in our world, none of us can truly rest. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a warm welcome to King's College. The opening words, as said by Nelson Mandela soon after his retirement from public office, resonate today and serve as a reminder to us all of our duty as citizens in a world where injustice still exists. We gather today to honour the memory of Neil Abbott and all those brave men and women who lay down their lives in the fight for human rights and social justice. Firstly, to our guest speaker, Professor Abed, who 
We are honored to have you with us today and look forward to your address. It is our privilege to host you at Kingswood College and we thank you for being part of this special day with us. A welcome to our Chair of Council, Mrs. Diana Hormi, and fellow councillors who have joined us. Also a special welcome to the Mayor, the Honourable Ms. Nongle Gaga, South Deep Trustee Ms. Tandeli Nishwanti, Headmasters and representatives from Bradstown Schools, delegates from Rhodes University, and in particular, staff from the Neil Agate Institute. The President of the OK Club, Mr. Warwick Stratton, and all Kingswoodians. Staff, special guests, parents, and members of the Bradstown community, we welcome you all here today. <coughs> to the current pupils of Kingswood, I welcome you as well. As the youth of our society, I hope that what you take away from today will enhance and serve to remind you of the important role you play in making a difference in the world. At this 12th Neil Abbott Memorial Lecture, I feel it would be remiss of me not to extend a special word of welcome to three gentlemen who have initiated and moulded this event into what it is today. Mr. Keith James, Mr. Rob Charlton, and Mr. Neil Hartenberg. You have, through this annual event, kept the memory of Neil Agate alive at Kingswood College. But more importantly, you epitomise what Neil Agate stood for. And through the example you set, have installed in our past and current learners values that without a doubt have and will continue to impact on society in a positive manner. I would now like to call upon our Chair of Council, Mrs. Diamond to introduce her with Professor Abby. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Sanjay Kalimi Nebali Kedere Kakul Mohamed. It's been my privilege to introduce a number of speakers for the Neil Agate Memorial Lecture over the past few years. Each year, I'm fascinated by how the lives of the speakers resonate with the theme of the Neil Agate Memorial Lecture, Standing Up Against the Judges. Our speaker this year is no exception, Professor Adam Habib, currently the Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of the Francis Front, an academic, a researcher, an activist, an administrator, and renowned political commentator and columnist. What a privilege it is to welcome Professor Habu to Kingswood today to deliver the 12th Neil Agate Memorial Lecture. With over 30 years of academic research and administrative experience in five universities and many local and international institutions, boards and task teams, <coughs> Professor Habib has been in the eye of the storm, can you say? during the fees must form protests, not only at his own university, but in pursuit of a national solution to the issues of find, funding for higher education. And speaking to him earlier, he will be releasing a book soon. And we had some interesting discussions about the naming of that book. He is a former chair of University of South Africa, which represents vice chancellors in higher education in the country. He has been working with government, students, and other stakeholders to find solutions to issues around funding for higher education. His professional involvement in the institutions has always been defined by three distinct engagements, the contest of ideas, the translation into actionable initiatives, and the building of institutions. He has focused on building African research excellence. Prior to joining this, Professor Habib served as deputy Vice Chancellor for Research Innovation, Library and Faculty Coordination at the University of Johannesburg. Professor Labib holds a qualification in political science from three universities, including the University of Natal and Wits. He earned his master's and doctoral qualifications from the Graduate School of the City University of New York. His political awareness started at school when he learned about Nelson Mandela and Steve Baker and where he was inspired by the civil rights movement in the United States. 
This intensified at university where he got involved in the unity movement and the Sacred Trust, focusing on education and literacy projects for Black South Africans and trade unions. Trouble with the authorities inevitably followed, including a short period of detention in solitary confinement. Professor Habib is a well-known public figure in South Africa, whose opinions are often sought by both the print and broadcasting media. He's been included in the Financial Mail's top 300 most influential black people in South Africa. He's intelligent, spoken, charismatic, and, and, writes, and writes eloquently and sensibly about issues that are confounding many of us in today's complicated South Africa. <laughs> He has published numerous scholarly books, both chapters and journal articles, over the last decade. His latest book, South Africa's Suspended Revolution, Hopes and Prospects, has informed debates around the country, around the country's transition into democracy, as well as its prospects for inclusive development, transformation, democracy, and development of fundamental themes of his research. His contributions recently resulted in his election to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, in addition to serving as a fellow on both the African Academy of Sciences and the Academy of Science of South Africa. Professor Habib is a pro prolific tweeter, Twitterer, <laughs> and you would do well to follow his Twitter account, as is the requirement of Twitter to be short Besides, Professor Habib often unpacks complex news issues into understandable, clear tweets which serve to inform and inevitably exasperate the Twitter sphere out there. I read one of his latest tweets posted after unpacking a recent opinion from the former President Tabo Mbeki on the land question. And I quote, Too many people don't read yet comment. They think insults make up for thinking. Too many also respond with bravado. This generation will finish the revolution. Revolutions happen with thought and not rule. Grow up. <laughs> with that, I'll hand over to Professor Abi. We are greatly honored to have you here this morning to deliver the Neil Agate Memorial Lecture. Your life and work certainly resonates with the theme of this lecture, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say to us. Welcome, sir. The Chair of Council, the Master of the Faculty at Kingswood College, my friend, Comrade Silvia Babazella, Vice Chancellor of Rhodes University, the Mayor and other notable dignitaries, friends and colleagues. And since I can't confess, I cannot resist but say comrades. <laughs> Thank you for honoring me with the opportunity to speak today as one in a long line of illustrious speakers who have all played a part in standing up for justice, for injustice, you know, against injustice in our country. Today, we honor the memory of the elect who paid the ultimate price in the fight for equality and economic inclusion during the apartheid years. Neil Abbott was a privileged white man who qualified as a doctor and could have chosen an easy path. Instead, he stood up to the inequalities of that time and fought for the rights of black South Africans. He made a moral decision to not just work for the poor and oppressed through his medical skills, but to actively fight against the very system that kept them poor and oppressed. For as it was just not a medical doctor, he was a political activist and a trade unionist. His bravery gives us the chance to ask ourselves some uncomfortable questions. In honoring his memory, we must all ask whether we will take the easy path or whether we will fight injustice 
and inequality in our society. And we must also ask how we will go about doing this. Both Kingsford College and my own institution, the University of Pakistan, are privileged institutions. In many ways, our institutions are the very symbols of inequality of the past and our present. We need to confront our position in the world in order to undo the injustices of our past and ensure a more equal future. The, rest, the best way to do this is by living the principles of equality, non-racialism, and non-violence. It is on these principles that I wish to speak today and how we confront them in the peace was for protest, arguably the most significant social mobilization by students in South Africa since 1994. Over the past year, I've been writing on my own experience during the protest and reflecting on how one needs to achieve social justice through social mobilization, non-racialism, non-violence, and ethical behavior. Social justice has to be advanced in the world that exists, not the one that exists. This obvious statement is perhaps the single most important lesson that advocates of social justice need to not only realize, but also internalize. There is now a recognition among many in the social justice community including its theories, that the overthrow and the transcendence of the political and socio-economic order will not be a single event, but a drawn-out process of advances and retreats. Thus, for social activists who are committed to change, the issue of strategies and tactics is important. We should develop strategies and tactics not from what we think is fair in an abstract worldview, but rather from what will work in the realities of the context that we are currently in. This does not mean that our ultimate goal should be forgotten, but rather that we need to understand the possibilities of achieving our goals, not from a rule book or formula of a time that was passed but from the contextual realities of the present. Too often, too many demand reforms that are compatible with an alternative social order, rather than those that are viable in the present, and yet push the boundaries of what is acceptable so as to enable the political dynamic of continuous social change. Perhaps this has to do with the fact that too many social activists are so, so emotionally attached to their cause and so invested in their cause that they cannot imagine that there are others who are not the enemy and yet may not share the same strategies. It is often said that anger and rage are essential in mobilizing against injustice. But what is also often forgotten that that same anger and rage can blunt the ability of actors to critically dissect the forces arraigned against them and to determine how to neutralize or demobilize these in order to register social gain. All of this was evident in Fees Must Fall, and it may be a valuable lesson to extricate the lessons thereof, not only for the better advancement the struggle of free education, but also for those associated with all with other social justice causes. Perhaps it's best to begin by say, stating boldly that mass action and social mobilization is an essential component of the strategic arsenal of social justice. <coughs> I as a public he has a seen that the students achieve in 10 days what Vice-Chancellor 
had been debating for 10 years. The challenge of peace must fall is not that it is a legitimate cause. It is a perfectly legitimate cause. Because effectively it is unacceptable in South Africa today that talented students from poor communities should not have the right to world-class education in our public institutions. And the challenge that we confronted is that the cost of coming to our public institutions has become astronomical over the last decade. The reason is this, that since 1994, we have decided to massify higher education. In 1994, we had about 420,000 students in higher education. In 2015, we had 1.1 million students in higher education. But as we massify higher education, the state did not make concomitant investments in the higher education project itself. So the per capita subsidy per student in higher education consistently declined over 20 years. We massified the system, but we didn't make the concomitant investments, and so the per capita subsidy declined. The net effect was the vice chancellors like myself and Seesman began to increase fees to ensure that we protected quality in higher education. And so for over 10 years, we increased fees in double digit figures. The net effect was pricing out higher education outside the hands of not only the working class, but also the middle class. We knew that there was a problem. We knew that they were heading for a major social exposure. And in a sense, Vice Chancellors had opened up a conversation with the state for over eight to ten years, effectively saying it was unsustainable. But what happened is very little substantive change was made to the subsidy formula to enable greater investments in higher education. And what do the students do? They effectively mobilize the vast majority of students to effectively change the gap. And in the process, what they did is they were able to shift the systemic parameters of what was possible and open up policy, policy options and financial concessions that were not seriously considered in the law of daily engagements. In my view, some of these outcomes exceeded those expected by the student leadership themselves. In Bits, the SRC President's original proposal to the Bits Council was not for a no fee increase, but rather for a more measured one in the region of 90%. When the protest kicked off, this demand shifted to no increase. And when this was achieved, it shifted again to free education at universities. This was not the first time that these demands had been made. Indeed, they had been made regularly across the country for some time. But government, and more particularly Treasury and the Presidency, were not responsive to these demands. But when the 2015 protests erupted and took on the scale that they did, generating widespread support from stakeholder groups across society, that not only was significant financial concessions made with the President's agreement that the state would be responsible for the fee increase, but a policy process was also initiated to fundamentally change the financing of universities. Similarly, the insourcing of vulnerable workers was never on the agenda until the 2015 protests fundamentally changed the environment. In 2015, I sat up the streets in the Solomon Ochoan Concourse overnight. And in a sense, we debated about East Coast Fall and the fact that there was uh, such an exorbitant increase. 
And I said to the students, I acknowledge that this pain is as exalted. And I wish I could make it go away. But I really can't. Because if I ever really make it go away, it means I will have to cut the academic program. And the consequences will be to the quality of higher education. So as much as I sympathize with the cause, I cannot make the challenge go away. The only way this challenge can go away is if the state pays it, it makes the pay, makes the fee. And I said we've been engaging the state for 10 years on precisely this question. And the argument was, I said to them, I don't think the state is going to make the difference. It was a Friday night. About three o'clock in the morning, the student leaders came to me and said, we can't continue the whole night. We have to go home now. And so would you please make a concession? And I said, no, I can't make the concession as much as I agree with the course. And eventually we agreed to learn to fight another day. We signed an agreement that said we'll all come back on Monday morning and have round two of easy bus. And so we parted the weekend. We came back on Monday. And on Monday, which was not the only university on the strike, all 26 universities on the strike. By Wednesday, students in the Western Cape marched on Parliament. By Thursday, students in Cartel marched on Rutulia. On Wednesday evening, officials in the presidency called me on behalf of the vice chancellors and said, what should we do? And I said, the students have a cause, they have a legitimate cause. Actually, we sympathize with their demands, but we're not going to make that go away. The state has to make that go away. They have to pay the interest. And on Friday morning, President Jacob Zuma agreed to pay the 10% fee increase in all universities at a cost of 2.5 billion. The students achieved in 10 days what vice chancellors had been debating for 10 years the power of social action, power of the new packet recognized so many decades ago. Social mobilization in both fees must fall and in the insource was essential to put on the systemic agenda policy and financial options that were previously unavailable. But I want to state that social mobilization cannot be unqualified. This is where I depart from most of the fees must fall activists and some of their supporters who tend to romanticize social mobilization. Social mobilization is indeed incredibly important for opening systemic parameters. But some forms of social mobilization can also undermine the possibility of social justice itself. <coughs> this is also quite evident in the peace must fall movement. As social mobilization became more violent, as it increasingly started to violate the rights of the institutional community which it professed to represent, so too we became more factionalized and lost the broader support of the public itself. As importantly, it forced authorities, both institutional executives and national government, to begin to activate security protocols in an effort to protect universities and the broader public. The net effect was that in a number of institutions, including this, the violent social mobilization was contained by stringent security measures. This, of course, created huge controversy, not only between institutional executives and student protesters, but also within the broader progressive community itself. Peace was for protest in 2016. Let's be honest with this violent. 800 million rand worth of infrastructure 
was destroyed at South African universities. And it is truly unacceptable to say that you are fighting for the cause of free education and then willingly destroy the very infrastructure that can deliver that very education for the poor and the marginalized. And so in a sense, many of our chancellors, myself included, came out very heavily against the violence of these must fall. In 2015, we remained relatively contained in our response because we recognized the legitimacy of the cause. In 2016, I wrote, means are as important as ends, and how you conduct your struggle is important for creating the very outcome that you want to achieve. It is also worth stating that, stating that social mobilization on its own does not translate into progressive social outcomes. For such outcomes to be realized, it needs to be institutionalized through processes of deliberation and policy formulation. It requires the presence of intra-institutional actors who are willing to use the opportunities that are enabled by the social mobilization to craft new social policy. Again, this was very evident in Fismas form. The fact that it occurred in a democratic society and in a context where the ruling party was deeply polarized ensured that peace was formed, received a responsiveness from institutional actors in the state. The democratic, democratic character of South African society and the vibrancy of civil society meant that all the call of repression was not on the agenda. The peace was false protest emerged soon after the Malikana massacre, where police were killed, killed 40 workers, in a mining labor dispute. The event traumatized South Africa, deeply delegitimized both the police and parts of government, and paralyzed the police in their management of the student groups. The democratic character of South African society, the divisions within the ruling party, the widespread support of the social movement, and the paralysis of policing in the aftermath of Barikash all created a resonance for the demands of peace must fall within the institutional apparatus of the state itself. Third, the struggle for social justice must contain within it the imagery of the very outcome it desires. This means that it should be framed in a language and its activities need to be organized in a manner that is incompatible with the social justice outcome. The strategic principle has, to, has a particular resonance of peace for war. For it is here that the movement also found dramatically influencing its trajectory in a factualized and violent direction. It is worth noting that in 2015, the movement was largely framed and organized in an anti racist and non-racial terms. The protests had their goal, the lowering of the cost of higher education, and then and thereby enabling poor and the middle classes to more easily assess the universities. Remember the magnificent march on Parliament, where black and white, rich and poor, marched together in support of all poor people having access to higher education. Yet, when the 2015 protests were successful, political parties tried to intervene to gain control and direct the movements. So it became factionalized and racialized. Some students started to wear t-shirts with racialized statements, while others began to frame the movement in explicitly racial terms. As this happened, and as other parts of the movement refused to condemn and marginalize these elements, so too did the broader group of students withdraw from the movement and its activities. The net effect was that the movement in 2016 
had neither the non-racial flavor nor the broad support that the movement had experienced a year earlier. This trajectory suggests why it's so important for those interested in social justice to frame the movement in explicitly anti-racial and non-racial terms. Two reasons are evident. The first is if the social movement is to be successful, it needs to draw the support of the vast majority of society. In the language of the United Democratic Front of the 1980s, one needs to maximize support for the movement and minimize support for the advocates of the status quo. Framing the movement in more racial terms will explicit, with explicit racial or prejudicial statements weaken the support for the movement and allow adversaries to caricature it as an agent of division and hatred. The second rationale is perhaps even more fundamental for it speaks to the social justice outcome. A central political tension confronts all oppressed communities in their struggle on whether the movement should be framed as a retreat into nativism where the previously oppressed are now made the master or a progress towards the construction of a non-racial cosmopolitan society in which all have a future. The path the society takes, nativism or non-racial common humanity, is not crafted at the point of victory when one ascends to political power, but rather in the character of the movement that is built and the strategies and tactics that it adopts. A final set of deliberations that the evolution of peace must propose for the advancement of social justice is whether there should be an ethics in the conduct of social study. In late 2015, I opened my first reflection of the student protest, in which I argued that there cannot be a divorce between means and goals, and that the former means is fundamental to realizing the latter goals. I now, as suggested earlier, even more convinced of the need for this. These must all strongly suggest that an ethics needs to be manifested not simply by leaders and activists in the movement, but also by supporters within the university and external to it. Perhaps the most important ethical value to underscore in the importance is the importance of movement leaders being consistent in their public and private engagements. In my earlier conversation, I spoke about student leaders I engaged. They would say one thing in public and they would say something else in private. I have student leaders who said we don't want to write exams in public and private. They came to us to write exams in quiet in the vice chancellor's office. I have student leaders say we will we were not engaging in public and then privately say we were engaging. And student leaders say, don't bring the police. And then privately say, thank you for bringing the police, because it creates a protective environment for all of the students. The problem with much of this behavior is not simply the individual publicity, but it seems to emanate from a belief that a student politics involves saying one thing in public and doing another in private. Student leaders across the spectrum became captured by a politics of spectacle, where they believe they are obliged to be extremes, rude and obnoxious in public, and then pragmatic and polite in their engagements outside the public eye. There's also the belief that the overriding goal is to win whatever the means that are used. Student activists would often and willingly make false accusations of sexual and racial harassment against security officials in incidents of eviction and of security action without recognizing by opening, that by opening the floodgates of false allegations, they are making the struggle to address real instances of these scourges that more difficult. This kind of duplicity should be of concern to all of us. It suggests that despite the criticisms of, the, of existing political elites, 
some of the prominent leaders among the new generation of activists are displaying behavioral traits that are typical of the most anal of the current politicians. There has been an astonishing level of intolerance amongst the student leaders themselves. You would be amazed at how many times they have tried to invoke university disciplinary processes against other student leaders. Students outside the movement were treated with far more disdain, and those who dared to formally organize outside the peace was called for were harassed, harassed, threatened, and clearly as stewards of white interests and of executive management. The intolerance reflected in the disruption of meetings of stakeholders and then peace was formed. Numerous meetings of university executives were disrupted across the system, as was the National Education Crisis Fund. Essentially, there is a widespread belief among leaders and activists of peace was formed that anyone who did not follow or share their views was a legitimate target for silence. This intolerance not only affected leaders and activists, but also supporters. The challenge of these ethical violations among leaders, activists, and supporters is not only that they delegitimize the social movement, but also that they consolidate a cynical view of politics within their own society. People come to see all politics, politicians, and political actors as duplicitous and unprincipled. Saying one thing and doing another. As was suggested earlier, a movement seeds an imagination of the alternative society that is ambitious. This requires not only that the strategies are compatible with that outcome, but also that the participants practice a politics that is distinctive, more ethical than that which prevails in the political system. Therefore, one needs to, to be capable of incubating an alternative behavior compatible with the social order <coughs> that is desired. There's a lesson to be learned from Nelson Mandela. It's that fundamental lesson. Ironically, there's a lesson to be learned from Steve Beaker, from Robert Sabukwe, from me, Agat. It's that lesson. That you incubate in your political practice the very imagination of the alternative society that you would like to build. And that requires a non racial form, a non violent form, a social mobilization, and an ethics and an integrity that can inspire a new society to be built. Returning to the issue of our privileged institutional groups. We are which today are asking that despite our privileged history, how can we use our institution to address the inequality that burdens our world? And the question that poses is how to enable access to wits for children from poor communities and to provide them with a world-class, socially relevant education. If we are to succeed in this, then we will enable the class mobility that is so necessary to address the ever-increasing inequalities and the ever-increasing social polarization that emanates from it in our society. The same challenge, of course, confronts King with College. I would be remiss in a near active memorial lecture not to pose this question to you. What are you doing to enable access? What is your relationship with schools that house the poorest of the poor? How are you enabling the use of the incredible sporting and educational infrastructure so that it can benefit a wider community? How are you enabling class mobility in our society? For if you are simply teaching the children of the rich, then all you are really doing 
is reproducing existing elites and thereby consolidating the very inequality of our world. These are hard questions, I acknowledge. But if you truly want to honor the memory of Neil Knight, then you collectively need to have the courage to ask and respond to these hard questions, like we have to do at this university. Once again, I thank you for the privilege of allowing me to speak to the memory of the land. This valiant fighter for freedom to whom each one of us owes an enormous debt. May he rest in peace and may his memory inspire us all to co-create the better one. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks go to Prof Habib for his words and I know there will be a more fully, more uh, fuller thanks uh, shortly. We move to another important part of today's ceremony uh, and that's the award of the Neil Haggett Awards and they were created in 2009 and awarded for the first time in 2009. The Neil Haggett Award was presented to the school by the class of 1970 and they felt it was important that we acknowledge in the school Neil Laggett's contribution to our society but more importantly that we identify pupils within the context of the school who would uphold that kind of tradition. And so the Neil Laggett Award is an award which is nominated by the pupils of the school from which they nominate candidates and out of which the award is made. And it is certainly my privilege this morning to be able to make the award and I will ask Professor Habibi shortly to hand over uh, the respective acknowledgements for that award. This year is unusual in that we have two awards both of them equally justified. And certainly when I read out the citations, you will understand why the committee resolved to awarding both of these candidates this prestigious award. The first award goes to, and I would invite the awardees at the end of when I had read the citation to come forward to the area in front of the altar. Daniel Pluso epitomizes what service beyond self means. Her awareness of the needs of those around her, as well as community issues, has resulted in her taking the lead or participating in numerous initiatives that speak to the lives of others. A few examples of these would include leading a right to education drive that saw donations of station, educational games and puzzles, made to three non-fee-paying schools in Grahamstown East. Being involved in the collection of books and a monetary donation for the library at Umbalela High School. <laughs> Serving as a tutor for three years on the Mary Waters Maths Support Program. Helping out during her holidays at Port Arthur's Hospital in celebration of people with disabilities on casual day. Being a member of Internet for three years and a committee member for two years, during which she actively assisted in running various and many internet projects, providing academic support for the children of Kingdom Star. In addition to this, Danielle is the head chaplain's chair, chairperson of the Interact Committees of Grahamstown, and holds a silver level in the President's Award. One of the nominators, a fellow pupil, had this to say. 
And you know, it takes an interest that every person struggle, no matter how small, and always stands up for those who need a hero of sorts. Daniel leads by example and is not afraid to get her hands dirty, all the while combining organizational expertise with a humble spirit. Her willingness to involve herself in service projects, service projects goes beyond the call of duty and is an inspiration to others. In this way, she embodies the principle of selfless giving to a cause greater than herself, mirroring the qualities found in the late Neil Haggard and making her a worthy recipient of this memorial award. And the other award. Second awardee this morning, Etienne Ferrer, is an outstanding example of moral courage and a humble servant, and a, and, and, sorry, and a, and a humble in servant leadership. Terms such as finding positivity and adversity, a keen sense of justice, courage to stand up against the prevailing culture, integrity, and good judgment abound in this nomination for the Neil Agat Award. Etienne has served his fellow King's Williams and especially the school's younger members with great distinction and an abiding sense of fun and enthusiasm. His strong Christian values has seen him taking the lead and be very positive in influencing <laughs> others during two chapel outreach missions. He is a role model for young Christians in kids with a mission in the school. He has an excellent grasp of current and international affairs and serves as captain of the data. Along with his leadership position, he is also a chapel student and deputy head boy, both of which place further demands on his time. The head of the music school is of the opinion that Etienne, as band leader, pretty much turned the concert band round this year with his quiet yet efficient discipline. Not merely pursuing his musical talents for his own again, he also is known to have been a great help for a number of young musicians in the music school. When thought in his quest for judgment, unfairly criticized or subjected to serious peer pressure, he remains steadfast and gracious, responding in a mature and loving fashion while sticking to his principles. He is known to be supportive and encouraging in nature taking on the fight of those who have been unfairly treated, who have less of a voice. Etienne, in all his conduct, displays strong parallels to the courage and character associated with Neil A. It is therefore also, worth, also a worthy recipient of this award. Thank you, unfortunately. The new Agat Memorial Lecture Award reminds Kings Williams and all members of the college about service above self. 
fosters a spirit of commitment to social responsibility and standing for social justice within the college, as well as the greater community of Groundtown and South Africa. This lecture remains one of the most significant and cornerstone events on the calendar, and is only made possible by the hard work of various members of the college. A special mention goes to Mrs. Dalbornby, Chair of Council, for reading and introducing the speaker. Thank you to the Agat family for their kind and generous donation of the beautiful flowers, as well as Joel Berger for their donation of the book titled Death of an Idealist in Search of New Agat by Beverly Nyan that accompanies the award. And a tremendous thank you goes to Dr. Hibbert. Thank you so much for your role in such an important event and memorial. Your research and expertise being in democracy, transformation, and development fit perfectly with the purpose of this lecture. I'm not only saying I thoroughly enjoyed your talk and have taken a great deal from it. So, Professor, on behalf of King's College, we would like to offer you a token of our appreciation. Ladies and gentlemen, before we close our time together, I would invite you to be still and after a brief moment of quiet, I will lead us in prayer. Let us pray together. You are God, all knowing, all loving, and all powerful. You are love, ultimate reality. We sit in this chapel in Kingswood College in Eastern Cape Cod, in a country called South Africa. Our country's past and present is not hidden from you. Conversations that happen in boardrooms and parliament, you hear them, whether helpful or hurtful, transformative or corrupt. And you hear our conversations too, in coffee shops, shabines, schools and workplaces. And beyond what we say, you know our thoughts, our hearts. Thank you that there are lots of things to celebrate in our land, many stories of hope and transformation, acts of generosity, bridge building, understanding, forgiveness, people serving and sacrificing. Some of these stories are our stories. But we confess that the challenges of our country sometimes seem overwhelming. We are quick to criticize or complain, or we bury our heads in the busyness of our own lives, ignoring what is happening around us, hoping in vain that somehow our context, our community, has no influence on us, nor invites us to respond with our giftedness. It's not that we don't want to change God. It's just that change is really hard. It's a world of fists. And we have no shortage of excuses to fight. The smallest difference, the most insignificant slight, the least justifiable defense of our rights or privilege, and our fists are raised and thrown, and we feel no shame. Sometimes we raise our fists out of fear. Forgive us the violence of our hearts. Teach us to open our hands, Jesus, like you did, to repair the places that war has destroyed, to heal the people that hatred has wounded, to rebuild the communities that violence has fractured, to reconcile the factions that fear has divided, to forgive the wrongs that have dehumanized us all. Teach us to open our hands, Jesus, like you did. And though nails may be all that is offered in return, may we know that ultimately love wins. Gracious God, today we remember Neil Agate and his legacy, the young man who stood against injustice and held within him a vision of a better side. We commit our beloved South Africa to you and her leaders in government, opposition parties, business, academic, and community leaders. We pray for wisdom, integrity, and peace. And we pray for ourselves, reach into our hearts with courage and hope to embrace the tough transformations, to make the real and lasting changes, to seek the truly good answers for the sake of our families and communities our countries and our continents, our people and our planet, for the sake of our very selves. So Lord, may we think deeply and reflect. Help us renew our minds. Help us to listen to you, others and ourselves, 
and change our hearts. And may we then, in our families, friends, and communities, open our hands and lift up our voices to be part of building an exciting and life-giving future. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite uh, staff and guests to join us for tea on the lawn, just up the road on the right-hand side adjacent to the museum. Uh, if you do have a ticket for lunch at the Wyvern, can I invite you to go up there and make sure that you are seated at 12.45, uh, because uh, Professor Bid would, would not like to miss his flight, and so we need to start promptly. Thank you for joining us this morning, and I invite you to remain seated as the official party leaves, followed by staff and guests. <laughs>